So welcome to another session of virtual SEO health. Uh, originally an SEO conference in Central Europe, but uh, for the past year, we've been doing these live streams with uh, different guests from Central Europe and both abroad. Um, my name is Daniel Durish and I'm from Basta Digital, a digital marketing agency based in Slovakia. And today, Joining us from Vancouver Island in Canada is Dana Di Tomaso. She is a president and partner at Kickpoint. Hello, Dana. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. And she's going to speak today about evaluating content and SEO results using Google Analytics and Google Tech Manager. Uh, let me just remind you that uh, you can watch uh, the previous sessions uh, of, of our SEO draft. At, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, uh, with people like Rand Fishkin, uh, Late Bill Slav, the Barry Schwartz, and others, uh, feel free to check it out. And regarding the questions, we have uh, Slido set up. Uh, you can join uh, us at slido.com and just use the event code SEOGAF. And you can ask the questions in the meantime while you see something interesting when Dana is, uh, while Dana is presenting or later uh, after she finishes the presentation uh, as well. So go to slido.com, enter SEO code, uh, event code SEO draft and uh, ask your questions. Okay, Dana, uh, the, you can start with your presentation and uh, yeah. Let's see if that works. All right. Great, you should be seeing yeah. that. Yep, yeah, we see that. So Great. please, uh, please start and proceed. Okay. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, based on where you are. As Daniel said, I'm on Vancouver Island, Canada, so I'm on Pacific time, uh, which is 7 a.m., which is, you know what, this is actually, I like early morning, so this, is, this was not a problem to be here today. And I'm really excited I was asked because one of the things that I love talking about is evaluating success. I've been working in this field for, this is my 22nd year working in this industry, and things have changed so much from when I started in 2000. But one of the things, obviously, that's never really changed is success. Because I know a lot of us as SEOs, we talk about rankings, how to get them, how to keep them. You know, we present ranking reports to clients. I mean, hopefully not as much as we used to, but certainly like that is one of the tools in an SEO's toolkit. And one of the things that, you know, I want to emphasize is that rankings fundamentally are not the point of why we do SEO, right? We want to be sure that our customers and our clients are buying what we have to sell. They're engaging with us and they're essentially helping us complete our business goals or organizational goals, depending upon what kind of company or not for profit or charity that you work at. And of course, content is, is truly how you get there. So how can you tell if your content is actually successful in connecting with your audience or more specifically, how can you tell if it isn't connecting? Because that's really where the work is, right? To make that content better. If you can say, I know that this content is good, that's nice. That's one thing you can do. But on the other hand, to be able to say, you know what, this content I know is, for example, ranking well, but is converting poorly, or it's in that spot where it's ranking like in the 10 to 20s. And I know that with some changes, we can push it up and beat this competitor, which is always personally very fulfilling for me to be able to beat a competitor. Um, but, you know, how can you tell if that content is even being successful, right? You're just really wasting rankings if you have it pointing to pages that don't convert, or if you have content that just with a little bit of help could perform that much better. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So one metric that people, yeah, everyone, I'm sure all of us here, including myself, have used at some point to determine if your content is successful is the page view, right? It's one of the most common metrics, I'm sure. Almost everybody here uses Google Analytics. Page views is one of the metrics that's that's really emphasized in Google Analytics. But realistically, what does a page view actually tell you? Right? You think, you know, okay, well, somebody clicked on my result from the search engines and they went to my page, and that's a page view. Yep, totally. That is a page view. A page view is also someone, for example, clicking on the wrong ad. You know, how you've been on websites before and you're trying to click on a link and then all of a sudden an ad pops up just as you're about to click on that link and you accidentally click on the ad 
and then you hit the back button right away. That's a page view. I mean, it wasn't a good page view, but Google Analytics isn't judging. They just say, yeah, that's a page view too. Or let's say, for example, I have tabs open in my browser and those tabs have been open for a while. Those are also page views. Even if you leave that tab open for weeks, you're setting off page views. We're going to talk a little bit about more, talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So because those are all page views, do those page views, the, the bad ad or the person leaving the tab open, do they count as much as the person who searched for the thing, clicked on the search result, got to your site, engaged, enjoyed what you had to say, and then bought you know, what you were selling? I would argue that those page views probably don't count as much. But again, because analytics doesn't necessarily put judgment or weight on page views, it's just there as a metric, we don't know which page views are helping you be successful and what aren't. So that being said, how can you report more effectively on how people are engaging with your website? Well, unfortunately, Google Analytics is not going to do this for you. I know <laughs> Google Analytics is kind of the thing that got us into this mess in the first place. The new Google Analytics GA4 also is not going to solve this. And this is not a GA4 presentation, although I, I did talk actually to, to the team about doing a GA4 presentation, because I know that that's a topic that's you know top of mind for a lot of people right now. So I just want to say as a, a little segue, if you have not put GA4 on your website, your clients' websites, if you're in-house or agency side yet, just do it. Don't have to set up anything fancy. Just take that GA4 code put it on the website because the problem is that July 1st, next year, less than a year away, and you need to make sure you've got data coming into GA4 as soon as possible. So if you've been putting it off, just don't. Google Analytics has courses on it now. There's, I'm going to talk about some other options at the end. So just, just bite the bullet and get into that GA4. Um, so back to content <laughs> success. The thing is with GA4, there's still page views. They're recorded slightly differently than they were in Universal Analytics or, or UA for short. Um, so just switching to GA4 isn't going to magically make your analytics better, though. You'll be able to record more information and you will be able to report on your data in a different way than you could with UA, which is great. And I, I really like GA4, despite the bad rap it's gotten. I think that there's some amazing features in there that are really going to benefit us as SEOs. The interface, on the other hand, leaves something to be desired. But... I think GA4 is good generally, but it's not going to fix things. It's still the amount of effort you put into the data that you're getting, the amount of good data you're going to get out of it, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And that's the thing with analytics. If you don't put the effort in to make sure that you've got something good coming out the other side, you're going to end up in a situation where you're just reporting on every page view being equal when we all know they're not. So how are we going to change our approach to content success? So first, I want you to think about content success from different perspectives because at our agency, we have lots of different size clients, right? This isn't a one size fits all situation. What our small business clients wanna get out of their content is completely different from what a charity wants to get out of their content, which again is completely different from a large multinational corporation wants to get out of their content. Some things might overlap, but fundamentally these are different organizations with different overarching goals. And that's okay. It's just a matter of understanding what those goals are and then thinking how can content help us get to those goals. So I'm going to go into four different ways that you can improve your content measurement. Not all of these ways may apply to you. That's okay. Maybe all of them will. Also totally okay. So don't feel like because I've just talked about these four things, you have to do all four. Definitely do not. Maybe just one of them makes the most sense to you. It's here's a resource. It's not a you have to do this or else type presentation. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how are people engaging with your website right now? So that brings me to one of my absolute favorite questions. How many tabs do you have open right now? <laughs> you might take a minute, look at your browser. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how to organize your browser, but I am going to say that all those tabs you've had open for weeks and weeks and weeks, they probably are showing up as page views in analytics. Sometimes it'll show up as a page view, even if you didn't actually look at that page ever again. So for example, if you're on a laptop, as I am right now, you probably shut your laptop lid at the end of the day and walk away. And then in the morning, with your browser still open, you open it up again. When your computer wakes up, <clears throat> one of the things that it does is it reloads all of those tabs to make sure that the page still you know, exists and has it ready for you if you ever do actually click on it again. So the problem is that those tabs, they're sending page views when they get reloaded. Or if you're on a mobile device 
And let's say, for example, you're using Chrome, uh, use an Android phone. So when you open up Chrome and you're looking at that big tab list because you want to figure out what should be, you know, 100 tabs you want to look at, sometimes a page view is sent with those tabs, even when they're just in that tab view. You're not even clicking on it. You're not even engaging with it, but it's sending a page view. So the issue is that how can you figure this out? How many of your visitors are tab hoarders? And a tab hoarder is someone we call who's kept that tab open for weeks and weeks and weeks. Maybe they're engaging with it, maybe they're not. But the problem is that they're sending these sort of fake page views off to Google Analytics. And in order to tell what's real and what's not when it comes to page views, you need to be able to figure out who these tab hoarders are. So first thing you need to figure out is how is the page loaded? So did the visitor get there by navigating? So for example, they did a Google search, they clicked on your link in the Google search results, they open up your page. That would be a navigation type. Or if they clicked on your link from another website, also a navigation type. Was the page view from a reload? So they could have manually refreshed the page by, you know, I think it's F5 on a, on a PC. No idea what it is on Mac. I'm not a Mac person. But, you know, they could have refreshed their browser. Unlikely, but totally possible. Or the browser could have reloaded after having that nap that I just talked about. So that would also be indicating their tab order. You can also see if people hit the forward or the back button to get to that page. So the next question we need to ask is what kind of tab is that page loaded in? There's obviously two types of tabs that a page could be loaded in. The first one is a new tab. So again, if you clicked on a search result and it opens up, that's a new tab because it's their first engagement with the website. And so that's new to your website, essentially. Or if they say right-clicked and open in a new tab, also counts as a new tab. But if they reload or clicked on a page on your website and it didn't go to a new tab, it just went to the new page, that would be a reload, as in it was in an existing tab. So would it be new or existing are the two possible options. And then the other question, which is not necessarily 100% what we have to measure, but it's nice to know, is how many tabs does this person have your website open in? So did they just open a bunch of pages and new tabs, right? How many of us have been on a website and say, well, I don't want to lose the page I'm on, so I'm going to right click and say open a new tab. And the thing is with that, it's, it's useful to know if people are doing that because it really messes with your ability to tell navigation paths. Because when you think about a navigation path, right, and if you're using the path report in GA4, which is really nice. If you haven't tried it, you should check it out. Or if you're trying to use the old universal path analysis, which was not as good. Um, it says, you know, you went to the home page and then you went to this page and you went to this page. But what if you have eight different tabs open and you're flipping between these tabs? GA can't tell that you're doing that. But if you know, for example, that this individual user had your website open in five different tabs, then you can tell. So one thing that it can't tell though, is if you say had your website open in five tabs, and then you had another 80 tabs open, it can't escape the current website analytics to tell how many other tabs you had open. It's just how many tabs you had your website open in. Okay, so it's actually really easy to get this kind of data. This is an example of the data from our own website at kickpoint.ca. This report is built using Google Data Studio, using data that is generated in Google Tag Manager and sent off to GA4. So now I'm going to walk you through this dashboard. The navigation action is how they got to the page. A reload, navigate, like they clicked a link, back forward button, right, which we talked about. And you can see there, there's some options of people reloading the homepage or navigating to about pages or whatnot. The tab type is if the tab was new or existing. If it was a new tab, they just came to the site or they right click and open a new, or if it's existing, then they had it open and refreshed or they clicked to get to another link. And then the tabs open isn't all the tabs this person has open, it's just how many tabs of your website they have open, as I said. So, and before you ask, yes, there will be a link at the end of the presentation with all the details on how to set this up. So don't feel like you have to panic about how to record all this. I have a blog post, I have Google Tag Manager recipes, you're gonna learn how to set all this up. But the setup part is boring. So we're gonna talk about the results instead. This, that's the interesting part. What do you get out of this? So what we wanna know is if someone's a tab hoarder, that means that they had a reload navigation in an existing tab type. So that means that they're a tab order. And then if we pull that data together, then we can look at this kind of report. And this is aggregated for one of our clients. So that right column where it says percentage of tab orders, that's the percentage of page views that were the result of a reload navigation action and an existing tab type. I can't show you the actual page URLs because client data. So you can see that third row down where it says items added daily, 1600 page views in this time period. 
74.5% of the people viewing these pages were tab hoarders. And that's because these people were keeping the tab open and then viewing it every single day so they could come back and see what new items had been added, which meant that for this particular client, one of their goals was getting new people to the website. So they'd see this and be like 1600 page views, great. Except unfortunately, only 25% of them were from brand new people. 75% of them were for people who were just keeping the tab open forever. So while that's disheartening to realize that your data wasn't exactly what you thought it was. It also means that you can make better decisions. So yeah, it's, it's a way of, yeah, it's that depressing moment when you realize you weren't measuring stuff the way you thought you were, but it also gives you an opportunity to make things better and really focus on you know, getting towards your goals and kind of ignoring maybe those tap orders or giving them an email newsletter or something. So you can also expand on this with other information. So now that you have this, you could, for example, say, show me the sources and mediums of tab orders and show me the sources and mediums of non-tab orders. And then you can figure out how people are engaging with your website. Like is Facebook bringing your biggest source of tab orders, you know, so then don't pay any more money to Facebook if you're looking for brand new people, for example. There's lots of ways to slice and dice this data so you can get really interesting insights out of it. Next one, option. Uh, question number two, how popular is your content over the long term? So not just last week or last month, but for months, because usually when you report on stuff, you'll have a nice report. It'll have a default time period, like last week or maybe last month, maybe a few different time periods, but none of them are probably since the beginning of your website, right? So why not though? If you're reporting on something like your most popular pages in that report, you're reporting the most popular pages in that time period, not those quiet performers that have been delivering great page views month over month for months, but may not be as exciting as a blog post you just published. So the first thing you need to find out in order to determine this is how long has that page or post been around? Depending upon how your website is set up, this can be easy or difficult. Um, so for example, this is the metadata on a WordPress website that's using the Yoast plugin. Lots of people use Yoast, it's very popular. So I wanted to start with this. That article um, that I mentioned that I'll link to at the end has a piece of JavaScript that you can use to grab this piece of information. It goes in our Google Tag Manager container and then we save it along with the page view to say when this article was published. And if you're not using WordPress and Yoast, this is an Umbraco site. We also grab this date using JavaScript. Also included that JavaScript in the blog post at the end, so you can use that as well, because sometimes not every website's on WordPress. That's fine. And if we're being extra fancy, you might also want to consider saving the modified date, especially if you're doing lots of content edits, because then you can see if the edited date, for example, the number of page views per day has gone up since you edited the post or gone down since you edited the post. And that's a nice way to tell SEO success on changes that you've made. Is it driving more traffic? So if you have none of these things in terms of dates, you can't grab any date information from the website. We had a situation like that with a client. What I ended up doing was doing a screaming frog crawl and then scraping the date uh, by using the DOM to actually like do a custom extraction and grab the date and save it in a spreadsheet. So there's lots of ways to get the date. If you don't have schema or Yoast or any of that, you can still do this information. Okay. So in order to calculate this data now, we have to figure out how many views does this post have in total? So in Google Data Studio, when you set up this report, instead of setting the default time period to be last month, last year, last quarter, uh, what you're going to look at instead is use the advanced type in Google Data Studio. And then the time period will be the day the very first poster page was published, usually the published date of the website originally. And then you can set the end date to be dynamic and say it's basically yesterday. And that way the analysis is always up to date. The actual analysis in Google Data Studio uses a function called date diff, which is pretty simple. In this case, we're saying, look at the current date time and this client was on Pacific time in the States. So America, Los Angeles is the time zone and the published date. And so it's saying these are the number of days between the current date based on this time zone and the published date, which we've saved along with the page view in Google Analytics. Then it's a matter of math. It's the number of page views divided by the number of days the post has existed. So then you end up with a chart like this. So in this case, again, client data, I can't show you the pages, but um, you can see the page views in that column. And then you can see the page views per day. And what I really like using here is a heat map visualization because it really shows which pages might have been, you know, <laughs> making you look thinking were great, but maybe not as good as others. This is sorted by page views per day. So you can actually see the top number of page views is a page that doesn't, doesn't have as many page views in total as the one that's fourth down. 
which is a blog post that the client thought was amazing, but actually isn't driving as many pages per day as that first post, which is the first post they ever published and apparently is amazing and driving them lots of business. And again, looking at this with additional data, we can see the conversion rates for this content. So I didn't include it here, but that top one was having a much higher conversion rate than it, that fourth one down. So it really helps you figure out which ones you should actually be focusing on when it comes to content improvements or content or conversion rate optimization improvements. Like this kind of data helps you determine what kind of strategy you're going to have. Next question, was your content actually read? If it's a video, you can tell. Did they watch it? Did they not watch it? Simple. If it's content, this is harder. So content consumption is a metric we made up several years ago. It measures how long it would take someone to read the content on the page and then sees if that person stayed long enough to read that content. And then also checks to see if they actually viewed all the content on that page. So if they stayed on the page long enough to read that content and they saw the whole thing that that content was consumed. Otherwise, if they didn't stay long enough, then it was skimmed. So they scrolled all the way to the bottom, but they didn't hang out long enough to read the content. Uh, or it was hoarded where they stayed on the page, but they didn't scroll to the bottom. So they might you know, keep that tab running forever. And then you would know as well because you'd see it in the hoarded report. Or it's completely abandoned, which means that they didn't scroll and they didn't stay. So there's, again, a blog post how to do this. We first released this in 2018. But that was four years ago, time for a little update. So we updated the post so it's easier to implement now and it's GA4 ready. And most excitingly, we have a WordPress plugin for this. It is not an official plugin. You can't download it from WordPress yet. We're working on that. You can download it from our website though. And again, I'll have that link at the end. Um, and of course, I wanna emphasize, you don't have to be using a WordPress website. In the blog post, I also have a Google Tag Manager recipe to run this content consumption as well. Um, and we have it running on all kinds of different websites. So I explain how to do all that in the blog post and how to set it up. And then you can see, did people spend long enough on the page to read the content, that they see the end of the content? If both are true, then the content was consumed, otherwise it wasn't. And giving us content consumption rates can really, again, help us tell, are people engaging with, enjoying, possibly converting? Which brings us to my last question, which is, could the visitor actually do what we wanted them to do? Because often we'll look at conversion rate for a page and we'll say, oh, you know what, this conversion rate's really bad, what's going on? Maybe they didn't see the opportunity to convert. Did they see the form? Did they see the purchase button? Did they see the sign up link? If they didn't see it, you couldn't expect them to convert, right? But again, we report on conversion rate as if they, we assume that everybody saw everything, which we know is not actually the case, right? We all use websites. We scan them all the time. We skim past stuff. So of course you wanna know if people could see the thing you wanted them to see. So to show you how this works, I have an example of the Moz homepage. We're all pretty familiar with Moz. So I took a screenshot of my enormous desktop monitor. And you can see down a tiny little bit at the bottom is the call to action to try Moz Pro free right at the bottom. But if I'm on a mobile device, this is my uh, homepage on a Pixel 5, I don't see that call to action. I just see the get live stream pass, but I don't see the Moz Pro call to action. In fact, I have to scroll down and then I see it. So now you could assume I could convert because that button is there telling me what to do, but how many people actually scroll down far enough to see that button? So the thing is you could look at scroll depth, but the problem is the depth where the button will be shown is gonna be different depending upon different screen sizes. So instead what you create is um, a trigger in Google Tag Manager, it's called an element visibility trigger. And essentially you're asking Google Tag Manager to listen for when this button shows up on someone's view. So you figure out what's unique about that particular element. In this case, that is a link with a class of js-primary-cta. So that's what the visibility trigger would look like. But the button to get to the live stream pass also uses the same class. So how can I record, say, only the buttons that lead to the Moz Pro trial? So we just add another condition to this trigger, and we say that the click URL has to start with the path to the free trial signup. And it works even if someone didn't click on the button. When click URL is not that they clicked on it, it's what is the click URL of that link. So what I'm saying is, is look for the button that has this class and goes to this particular page and then record um, an event when that happens. And then we know if people actually saw it. So instead of reporting like this, where you say, well, this page had a thousand visits and it had 10 conversions, so it's got a 1% conversion rate. It seems very sad, right? The other half of it is you could say it had a thousand visits only 100 people saw the CTA, so that means that only 10% of your visitors saw the actual CTA. But out of those 100 people, 10 of them converted, which means you've got a 10% conversion rate. 
based on the people who could actually convert. 10% sounds a heck of a lot better than 1%. And it, then that you can say, well, wow, this page has a 10% conversion rate. If we can just show people where to convert, maybe we need to move some stuff around, right? Like that's, that's a good piece of information to have because it also means you can go back to designers and web developers and say, look, this page does convert great. It is not trash. It's just, we got to move some stuff around. So I've talked about these four different methods. Is that actually how you measure content success? Uh, maybe. <laughs> There's one more thing I want you to ask yourself. What's the point? Which, why are we here? It's a very existential question. But it's a good question to ask of each page on your site. There's a concept called jobs to be done, which if you work in software as a service type businesses, you might be familiar with this concept. Otherwise, the idea of jobs to be done is just jobs to be done, essentially, is exactly what it says on the tin. What is the job of this page and is it doing that job? And of course, it's highly unlikely that every single page in your website has exactly the same job. Some of them are focused on conversion, some of them are focused on content, some of them are sign up, for example, right? There's different things that different pages do. So the thing is, we want to make sure we're differentiating different success metrics for different pages. Because if you just pull a report and say anything where we have a long dwell time is successful, that may not be true if that, for example, is a sign up page. You don't want a long dwell time on a sign up page because that means that something's probably wrong with your form. So in that case, how about we take the pages on the site and organize them by job? So again, this is an example from um, my agency's website, kickpoint.ca, and you can see we've got different page paths. We've got different jobs to be done. So JT. BD. Um, content consumption, navigate, we want them to fill out a contact form. And so based on that, we want to know if people are doing those particular actions on those particular pages. So, and you can also even use a meta tag that's on the page itself. So for example, when we do WordPress uh, websites, we actually add in a custom field called the page purpose, which we then output as a meta tag. And then we grab that and save it along with the page view. So you could also do something like that. So then you can use this to filter out your reports. So when you're reporting on content consumption, only include the pages in that report that have content consumption as a goal. When you're reporting on conversions, only include those pages that have conversions as a goal in your conversion report. Because the idea here is ignoring what doesn't help you is just as important as looking at what does help you, right? Keep that in mind when you look at your data creator report. How much signal and how much noise are you introducing? Are you including pages in your conversion analysis where those pages aren't prepared to be included for converting? So for example, we had a report where people were including pages on the conversion report. And the only way people could see these pages is if they already converted. So of course, those pages had a really bad conversion rate because people already converted, which is why they're there. So it's like, don't include those pages then, because then what happens, leadership doesn't know that context they look at it and they're like, oh, this is crap, you know, forget this SEO budget. Well, no, just don't show them those pages because it's not relevant to the question at hand, right? And this way you can stay really laser focused and enact change in the stuff that does matter. So instead of saying, oh, that page converts better because it's the job of that page to convert, so ignore this stuff, right? You're not annotating the report. You're just showing people stuff that actually matters. By keeping it focused, you don't distract yourself or leadership, and th that way you're not getting distracted by things that ultimately don't help you make smarter decisions about your marketing. So here's the link I promised. I'll leave this up for a second. You can take a look at it. You can. It's pretty easy to remember. <laughs> so you get more details about everything I've talked about on our website at this link. As I said, there's examples to you know screenshots of reports. We have some Google Tag Manager containers in there. It's got everything you need. To take these concepts that I talked about today and make them happen in your organization. And if you're scared of Google Tag Manager, don't be scared. I am not a technical person, even though I've worked in this field for a long time. I started making websites well before they're anything like the websites that we make now. And they were not, they were pretty simple at the time. So if I can do Google Tag Manager and I'm not a developer, I don't know JavaScript, then anyone can use it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. Um... We have a couple of questions coming on Slido, so, yep. Mm -hmm. But uh, I still have some, maybe let's start with the with my question. Um, yeah. You mentioned this content consumption metric. Uh, do you have some, do you have like actual formula how to calculate it or is it more about uh, using heuristics or, or this approach? Yeah, so for us, when we look at content consumption, it's when you load up the page, the plugin or the Google Tag Manager recipe, whichever you're using, looks at the piece of 
it looks at the area of the page where you've decided this is the content that I want to measure and it counts the number of words in that content. And then you put in the number of words per minute because we have the amount obviously for English, but you know, different right. languages have different reading right. speeds, right? So make sure to change it based on the language of that particular page. Um, and then we say, all right, so we know that based on this, you know, it's going to take 15 minutes for someone to read this page. And then it starts that timer. So that's that dwell time. And then scroll to the bottom. And really it's just saying like, if they dwelled and if they scrolled, then that means the content was consumed. That's it. And then typically we would divide that by the number of page views and present it as a percentage. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's start with uh, Marty's question. Uh, have you experimented with some micro conversions like scroll depth, text highlighting or text printing? I think you yeah. mentioned uh, using scroll depth basically for this uh, dwell time or for, for actually yeah. evaluating the content consumption right but what about yeah. these uh, other other uh, actions like uh, for example copying copying and pasting so that basically goes for text mm -hmm. highlighting or text printing yeah we do record copy paste um there's a great recipe on i think analytics mania um mm -hmm. which is a great resource if you're not familiar with, with tons of great recipes out there so i believe uh, julius has that on his website so I recommend grabbing that if you're interested in looking at that. I find that really interesting. We use that a lot on, uh, on client websites. Scroll depth, absolutely recording that for sure. But as I said, remember that the depth is going to vary based on screen. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll run a visibility trigger again for CTAs or headings so we can see how far down the page people are actually getting in addition to scroll depth. Um, and text printing, yeah, if you have a print button, you can record that. There are some recipes that try to detect if you actually hit, you know, control P and printed without clicking on a print button. They don't work super well because um, it's not necessarily the same behavior in every single browser, but certainly, you know, experiment with it and see if it's something that'll work for you. Um, maybe regarding scroll depth, let, let's talk about it a little bit more. Uh, have you used, for example, would you recommend using for example, footer uh, container or footer box as, a, as, a, as an element for a visibility trigger, because that's basically mm -hmm. where the content ends, the main content ends, or, or do you have some other approach like putting some special element in the page just to just to mark where the content, the actual text content ends, or yep. what's your approach? Yeah, we've done both of those. Part of it depends on what the client has available to us on their website. Right. Um, you know, on our own website, for example, we have a little rocket ship at the very end of content. You click that, you get rocketed back up to the top. So we record if the rocket ship enters your viewport. Um, and if people click on the rocket ship as well, we're recording that. But different clients have different things. So some clients will have the end of the content. And they'll have a huge gap before the footer just because that's how their website is set up. So then we try to record the end of that div. And that's what that content consumption does is it actually looks at the end of that area as well. So, so keep that in mind. It's like there's different things that you can insert in. And if you can edit the code, great. Maybe you can just add like an invisible div that you're going to listen for. Um, it's up to you and what's possible for sure. Okay. And um, you mentioned about how you mentioned that there are actually lots of people who just keep their tabs open and, and the page reloads and reloads uh, on, on each uh, uh, browser opening or, or computer opening. So what is, is there a way to prevent these reloads or do we actually want them to be reported in Google Analytics and just to, to mark them as, as you as you mentioned? Yeah, you can't prevent them. I mean, you could, you could prevent them. So I'll talk about how you could in a second. But first, I don't know if you want to necessarily prevent recording them because, you know, again, like maybe tab hoarding is a good thing as far as you're concerned. You know, you want to see how people are engaging with this page over a long period or that they're, they find your post so interesting, they want to keep them open for weeks and weeks, right? Like maybe that's an okay thing to record. But GA doesn't by default, you know, be able to pass that judgment on, on if people are reloading or not. But one thing you could do, if you grab that recipe that is in the link, which was just posted in the chat, thank you. Um, one of the things you can grab is you could say, you know, evaluate the behavior of this tab and then send the page load only if it's a reload, or sorry, not a reload type, like a, you know, a, new, a new, new type, page. Yeah. right? Versus yeah. a reload of an existing. So, so you could, you know, put a little bit of logic in there to, to make that happen. Um, you could also say, use a lookup table and say, if it's a reload, send it to this GA property. If it's a new, send it to this GA property. Like there's, there's lots of different ways you can manipulate that data for sure. Okay. So we have another question on micro conversion. So, uh, I, I'm sure you did this, or you have, have had some experience with this, uh, 
uh, with your past client, if, for example, in, in Google Analytics, there was uh, a goal value that we could actually attribute to some goals. So have you experimented with anything like this uh, for the micro conversion? Yeah, definitely. Sometimes we'll put a uh, goal value on different conversions, but typically we don't necessarily do this in Google Analytics. We'll probably do this outside of it in something like Data Studio. And then it is customizable as well. So we can say, you know what, we think that, uh, actually I have a great example. We have a personal injury lawyer. They take in the cases, but they also refer cases out. They get money for referring cases out. It's obviously not as much money as they do for taking a case, but it's still there. So often we'll still give referrals some value. We don't necessarily count that as a you know, completed conversion because it was referred out, but there is some value. It's just like one tenth, for example, the value of a case. And again, we would put that weight in Data Studio instead of in Google Analytics itself, just to be able to say, you know, that's important. The other thing too with GA4, um, whoever asked this question, you definitely want to take a look at audiences because audiences in GA4 are really full featured and you can do some really interesting stuff by recording events, for example, when people enter an audience. And then you can, for example, know that someone viewed five videos and so fire off an event when that happened, for example, or that they you know, came to your website and then within a week they joined your newsletter. Those are the kinds of things you can record using audiences. And I think it's really cool for micro conversions. So check that out. Great. Um... So you mentioned you are using Data Studio. I think uh, you are probably also using Google Sheets just to record some values and pull them in that Data Studio, or do you have some uh, other approach? Yeah, we use BigQuery a lot as well. BigQuery, um, okay. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we're doing a little bit of pipeline work where we'll push things from different, so for example, like Facebook ads and BigQuery so that it's easier, it's faster as well to load it up. We also use Supermetrics quite a bit, but I find with the Supermetrics connectors, and this is nothing against Supermetrics, I think they have a great product. Any non-native connector is super slow in Data Studio. And it's nothing to do with Supermetrics, it's everything to do with Google just being really slow if it's not a connector they made. So a Supermetrics does have a Data Studio connector or there's lots of different ways to get your data into BigQuery. That can be really fast. Sheets is also super fast. Um, so you could, for example, use Supermetrics for Sheets and then have a regular pull into Sheets, which would then get pulled into Data Studio, also another quick way to do that. So there's there's lots of good tools out there for sure. Great, so let's go to the next one, which actually mentions how to visualize basically average number of page views from the date of publication on the timeline graph. I'm sure you can do this in Data Studio. Uh, do you think it's relevant to the basically the success or the, the metrics, SEO metrics reporting? Yeah, I mean, I think this would be useful if you're looking at, say, the velocity of page views per day over time. So I wouldn't necessarily look on it on a day by day basis, because I don't think it's going to show you anything interesting. But if you aggregate it by, say, weekly or monthly, especially if you have a post that's been around for a couple of years, if you look at the, how the page views per day have averaged on a weekly or monthly basis, I think that might tell you something interesting about, again, it increasing or decreasing. And that's the thing I was saying about reporting also the date that the post was modified, because then you can tell, you know, you modified it in March. And then before that, the pages per day were 10. And then you made this modification. Now they're 17. So obviously what you did had a positive impact. It may not be enough that you notice it and you're like, wow, this is just a rocket ship now. But it's certainly something where you can see that yeah, your improvements have had a positive impact. Well, we should be able to see this basically in Google Analytics without working with or without without the need for Data Studio because this is basically when uh, the first page view was uh, reported to Google Analytics and then we can see it on the on the timeline, right? And, yeah, uh, also... but the thing is, is the reason why you want to have the pages per day is because if the whole site got better in that time, this helps you better isolate. So let's say, for example, like your whole site is sort of getting 25% more traffic over that time period. It makes it really difficult for you to tell, like, what is the movement on this specific post? So that's right. why the pages per day is really useful because it sort of takes away that noise and just focuses on, like, how is this page doing on its own as a page view per day metric? So are there some other metrics that you recommend uh, regarding uh, basically what kind of SEO metrics uh, or for S for metrics for SEO content do you actually follow and recommend to follow for other people when they are reporting to clients? You, you mentioned the content consumption or content dwelling. Um, you mentioned um, basically the yeah, the, the visibility trigger, that, that, that's a good metric, I think, because as you mentioned, that it completely changes the 
the the number when we are reporting that to the client that there was only i don't know 10 per, there was only one percent of conversion rate but actually it was 10 percent from those who actually triggered the visibility right so are there any other similar metrics that, that you recommend yeah definitely um one of the things that we'll also look at and this is not necessarily not all these metrics we present to clients by the way some of these are more internal diagnostic metrics so really make sure you know based on the technical aptitudes say, of the people you're reporting to, you're not necessarily going to want to give them all this. But one of the other things that we'll do for ourselves internally is we'll make a, a bubble chart where we'll look at um, average rank and then the click-through rate. And so this is from Search Console, this data. And what we're trying to see is, are there pages that are ranking highly but have a lower than expected click-through rate? And that can mean that either you have a snippet, like you know showing up at the top of the page or showing up when people also ask, or you have an FAQ, or it can mean that your meta description and title tag can use some improvement to encourage people to click on your result versus you know whatever result they happen to be clicking on. Because we know that, I mean, Google has kind of stepped around the issue, but we know that if people click on our stuff, we're more likely to rank well. So if you have a, you know, if you're ranking, say in the five to 10 range, you have a really good click-through rate, you should see some positive movement on that. But if you're already ranking in the one to five range and you're not seeing the click-through rate that you would expect to see, then that's something to take a look at the search result and say, like, is there something that we can do here to improve this? Particularly meta description. I think a lot of people forget about how important those are. They're basically like tiny ads. So if you're not great at writing meta descriptions, it can be pretty boring. Like talk to your paid team if you have a paid person that you work with because they're great at writing those kinds of uh, encouraging micro copies, or even just look at the ads your company's running and like borrow from the ads as well for good meta descriptions. So it's, you just want people to click on your stuff. All right, and uh, let's wrap up with the last question, although I, I'm not sure if I understand it right. Do you, do you differentiate between average page view or page view mm. and some active tab view? Yeah, I think what they're asking is, uh, do I look at the difference between like the average number of page views oh, versus right. number, average right. number of active tab views? Yeah. So that report that I showed that example for that client where we're looking at the percentage of tab orders, we can also take a look at, you know, this is the total page views, right, which was included in there. And then what were the total number of page views for people who are actively looking at the page? Like, yeah. For sure. Um, we don't always do that for every client, but this is a metric we look at and then we see, is this an issue the client needs to be aware of, which, aware of, which they don't always, like it's not, not every site has a problem with tab orders. This one was particularly, I wouldn't say egregious. It wasn't necessarily bad. It was just really interesting. And they had a ton of tab orders, which is different compared to some of our other clients, which is why we reported on it for them. But ah, average visit duration okay, versus okay. Aver <laughs> average. Ah, okay. So visit duration. All right, in GA4, this metric is different now. It is now engaged time, and engaged time counts when the tab is active in the foreground. So it's actually more useful in GA4 now than it was in UA. So I would say, like, forget what Universal Analytics said about average visit duration because it doesn't know. Like, as soon as tabs came out, basically GA broke. <laughs> it couldn't handle tabs. GA4 does a way better job of understanding when a tab is active in the foreground. So definitely look at your data there. And I think you'll see some interesting uh, metrics that you can include in your reporting. Okay. I don't think we have more questions. So thank you. This was uh, Dana Di Tomato joining from Canada from Kickpoint Agency. Thank you, Dana. You bet. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for the great questions, everyone. Those are, those are awesome. And thank you uh, to everyone for participating and asking questions. Don't forget that uh, we'll have more uh, virtual SEO health events coming, uh, I think, next month and then another one in November. So let's keep your eyes open for that. Uh, we'll post video recording of this uh, live session on YouTube, and I think you'll also receive it in your email. So thank you again. Thank you, Dana, and have a nice day since you are just starting. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.